Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 10 of the ABT Time podcast. And today I do have my ABT Time podcast mug. It's three o'clock here in California. And what time it is? What time is it in Melbourne, Australia? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's clearly a different time to you because you can't even talk properly. It's 8 a.m. <laughs> here on Thursday morning in Melbourne. And, you know, it's kind of wintry out there. I can see a bit of sunshine. So I'm not complaining. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm a little tongue tied because I just finished an hour long Zoom session that was one of the most amazing experiences of my life with three young historians that Patty Limerick brought together, all three of whom are superstars and have been using the ABT in writing books and writing essays and spoke to me in fluent ABT language. Just kind of, it, it kind of blew me away. Uh, we are spreading into new and different disciplines, not to mention the business world and lots of other places. So on that note, it's all the more reason to do this special episode that we're doing here today on how to teach the ABT. And with a little luck, we'll do such a good job here that this will stand the test of time. And months from now, people will still be using this as a resource to get an introductory idea on how to teach the ABT. It's something we've been developing really for a decade, slowly but surely, trying to figure out the best way to do this. That's what today's episode is about. And we put in a lot of effort to get ready for this. On Monday, we did a one-hour session with, I think, eight of us and kind of hammered out what we'd be saying and what hit us in that long session was something that has never quite come clear up until now, which is the Dobjansky of the ABT in general. And we all know the Dobjansky template is nothing in blank makes sense except in the light of blank. And by the end of that discussion, we had come to the realization that nothing in the ABT framework makes sense except in, light, in the light of the problem. That's where it's the be all and everything and be all and end all. It's the everything. The problem is where it all starts. That's what that's going to be our overarching message today. If you want just one piece of knowledge on how to teach the ABT, it all begins with the problem. And our kind of watchwords are don't try and teach this thing unless all your participants have got a problem they're working on. I think that's what we've learned in a decade of, of teaching this is that it, do, it can go wrong if people don't have something that they're focused on. It all becomes very circular, which is the brain is activated by the problem. So why would you be trying to teach this to people that don't have a problem to start with? I think that's going to be our overarching lesson, we hope, of the session. But we've got probably- And Randy, six, I, think it's, yeah. I think it's pretty exciting that, that, you know, just in a conversation on Zoom on Monday, you got this new insight into something about the ABT, which you've been living and breathing for so long. It just shows how powerful it is. There's this big moment of light. And we're like, oh, yeah, it's the problem. That's the key. Yeah, that's one of two things. Either learning it is elusive or else I'm really dense. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just I know which one you'd vote for. Things. So, okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, but but seriously, you're right. That's what after all that, that's what keeps happening uh, bit by bit. OK, so on that note, and then, Jen, I've asked you, um, we're going to introduce each person as they come along rather than do all the introductions at the beginning. We'll bring in people one at a time and make sure if I don't introduce somebody or if they don't manage to introduce themselves properly, that you stop us and make sure that happens, yep. um, which is where this whole episode begins it was about a month ago. Jen, uh, sorry, um, Liz Peterson who was a participant in the 13th round of the ABT framework course, the one we did with Ecological Society of America. Right after it finished, she sent me a very nice email, said she got a lot out of the course, and then asked me, how, what do you recommend for how to teach this thing? And she had heard Jen mention that she's been teaching it for a year at, at Melbourne Uni. And so rather than answering her, I said, you know what, you just opened a whole can of worms. I think we need to take a month to get organized on this and do it the right way and turn it into an episode where we address this in depth how do you teach the ABT effectively? So on that note, let's bring on our first guest, which is Liz Peterson. And Liz, how's about if you give us a little introduction to yourself, where you are there at University of Colorado Pueblo, what you're doing, and really a few more details from that email that you started with. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm a, currently a postdoctoral researcher at Colorado State University Pueblo. And uh, the program that I work for is called the Communities to Build Active STEM Engagement, which is a program that uses undergraduate research experiences to engage undergraduate students from underrepresented groups in research to increase retention, recruitment, and graduation rates. Um, we do a lot of um, teaching of science communication as part of the problem 
or as part of the program, rather. <laughs> oh, <I'm sorry. laughs> been, my problem is everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I've been up since 4 a.m., so bear with me. Um, so after I took the course, which was really, really helpful, and I got a lot out of it, um, like Randy said, I reached out to him, and um, I, we're looking for feedback on how we can integrate this into our program so our undergraduate students can get benefit um, from learning this program. Great. Okay. So that's our starting point here. And we're going to go on a little journey here now over the next 80 or so minutes. And I think we hope another one of Jen's assignments to make sure that we do end up coming full circle back to finishing by addressing what Liz had asked there at the beginning. Um, And I want to start our journey by, we're going to present a bunch of experiences that we've had. We're going to tell some stories of what we've been through in learning about the, how to teach the ABT. And for us, it begins back in 2014, when my good friend Jade Lovell from Australia, who's going to join us right this moment, um, Jade contacted me when she first moved to New York City and had read my first book. And I told her I was just getting started putting together story circles, narrative training that was sort of sketched out in the Houston book. And so she joined in with me and we, for the first three or four years really together, put together the, the whole model for narrative training. Nobody had ever really kind of done narrative training like this at that scale. So it was a learning process. And one of the predictions that we had from the beginning, there were several predictions that lots of other people sort of made for us. And one of the simple ones was that they warned us that, you know what, this communication stuff, I think you're gonna find that it's gonna be the easiest to teach with young people because they communicate day in and day out and they do such a good job with it on all their social media. And when you get to the older people, you know, hate to say you can't teach old dogs new tricks. I think you're going to have a hard time with some of the older folks with this narrative stuff. That was our expectation. Now, for those who have taken the course, you've listened to me in the last few months. I've really gotten caught up in this realization of the parallels between really what you do in in the doing of science, which is two big things, um, expected versus observe. Anybody that's ever done a simple statistical test, you know, that's what it's all about. What was your expected ratio? What was your observed ratio? It's the same thing with communication. Communication is you begin with expectation. Here's what they say generally, and then you move to here's what I have to say. And by the way, on that note, you know, this is Jerry Graff's book that I'm constantly talking about and plugging. They say, I say, if you're a humanities student, you've probably had this in one, two or three courses. This has sold over 2 million copies. It's one of the most popular books. Unfortunately, the science world has still never discovered that book, but it's it's the same thing as the ABT, They uh, but therefore, they say is the and, it's the agreement, it's how you begin a good argument, I say is the contradiction, the but. And so it's the same stuff, expected versus observed. So we were given this clear expectation, which is that it's the young people that will get this stuff, the old people will have a hard time. Then we set to work on it. And this is where Jade is gonna take over and tell about the four prototypes that we did. So take it away, Jade, on that note. Does that all make sense to you? Yeah, so I should start by saying that I found Randy um, as an undergraduate. I was a science student with the attention span of a normal human being. So I found science classes. I I loved science. And then when I got into the university level, I found it so boring. Um, And so I thought there must be a better way of communicating science. And that's how I found Randy's books. Um, And so I was so delighted when we decided to run four prototypes. We, in 2015, Randy and I uh, decided to run these four prototypes and one of them was going to be at the undergraduate level, one at the graduate level and one at the postdoc level and one at the research scientist adult level. And, you know, having found Randy as an undergraduate myself, my hypothesis was, of course, the undergraduates were going to be the most open-minded, the most enthusiastic and the best at doing the ABT. But what we found was that was not the case. So at the undergraduate level, when we we were at a small college uh, working with undergraduates, and we found that they were the most enthusiastic. But um, uh, week after week after working with these students, we found that despite their enthusiasm, they actually weren't getting it at the intuitive level. And one of the reasons why is because they had no problem to apply the ABT uh, framework to. Uh, They were seeing it as like an academic theory rather than something that is applicable to the work. And this became really obvious around the eighth session of the 10 weeks where they had to rewrite their own problem, but they had no application. There was no problem in their life that they were applying this to. 
Um, and then uh, at the uh, grad and postdoc level, we were working um, because of an NIH grant, we were working with the University of Chicago. So we were dealing with older students and young adults. Uh, they were really good, a little bit less enthusiastic, enthusiastic, but also weren't really dealing with a problem. They didn't have the benefit of, the, of a lifetime of experience and problems to be solved. And surprisingly, completely against my hypothesis, the group that did the absolute best with the ABT was the adults at the USDA, the research scientists who were about in their mid fifties, who as soon as the before the first session had ended uh, using the ABT framework, were already talking about, oh, I can be using this in this problem that I'm dealing with in my life. I can be dealing, I can be using the ABT to help uh, apply for this grant. So they had applicable problems that they were trying to solve. So one of the things that I, we found, uh, despite my expectations, was that older people do really well when they learn the ABT framework because they often have problems that they can be applying it to, whereas younger people don't do as well, despite what my expectations were. Uh, that was excellent. Thank you very much. And yeah, that's that's exactly what we ran into for experience. Um, it, it was an incredibly tight correlation in our experiences, you know, albeit qualitative. And we talked at times about, should we go back and try and quantify this somehow? And we, and we actually, we tried that. Um, Liz, uh, Liz Foote, you want to join us for a minute or two because you got into the picture there as well. We videotaped all of those initial sessions, all 10 one-hour sessions for the four different prototype groups, undergraduate, graduate, postdoc, and research. And then we transcribed those videotapes. Then Liz set about trying to find some metrics that we could get a data set and eventually maybe we could write up a research paper on it. And really it was garbage in the end. And there's a paper that just came out this past week from a guy named Jack Grieve, who's a linguistics guy in Scotland who tracked us down a few years ago. And Jade and I gave a talk at South by Southwest and he wrote a great um, paper. Jen, can you give us a one sentence summary? You, you, you read that abstract, didn't you, of the Jack Grieve paper on lin linguistics, what he was saying? Uh, I did, but I'd have to go back and look at it. To give oh, okay, you sorry, did, summary, didn't mean, Randy, didn't mean to. You... I, I, yeah, I thought you'd send me an email about it. I didn't mean to throw you on the spot, but but basically, I'm happy to what, opt in on this I did. One. Oh, okay. I did send Jay, you an email, but that was a whole 24 no, no, hours ago. You know what? I'm confused. A lot with, happened with, since. I confuse it with Jade. But Jade, take it away. Jen and Jade, both with an Australian accent. Were, yeah, you know, I, I get you two so confused. Us. Yeah, <laughs> we've even correlated. Our, we've got the same costume on today. So I think the paper's point was that um, it's very difficult to analyze linguistics because there's so many variables. And yes. so it's, scientists really want to say it's this and this and this that makes great communication or a, a great, you know, that, that we're really focused on the data. So I know that Randy and I, when we were doing these pilots, people really wanted to give um, satisfaction surveys at the end. But that was not the best way of analyzing how effective the ABT was. It's not always, as a scientist, I love data, but it's not always uh, measurable how, because uh, communications has so many variables. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. And by the way, Julie Clausen, if you were here, I know you can join us today, but you'll be listening to this eventually, but she's from the fisheries world and they dealt with this decades ago in the fisheries world. It's the same problem. The management of fisheries is so massively variable that there were essays written in the 1980s and 90s that suggested maybe we shouldn't try and waste time on these quantitative models because there are just too many variables. They produce so much noise that you can do a better job just talking to fishermen who are out there year after year and have some sort of gut feel, overall intuitive feel for what's going on. There's sometimes when you're dealing with stuff that's so multivariate, you cannot generate enough science data to grasp, to embrace the variation. And then you're just dealing with noise. And that's what Jack Reeves essay was about. And that's exactly what we looked at with those things. And this is my gripe about a lot of these people publishing papers in science communication right now. Sorry to get going on grinding an ax, but there's so much garbage coming out with people putting together these PLLS papers where they've got data sets that don't get beyond the noise. And there they are having these sophisticated you know, discussions about multivariate statistics. When in fact, it's what Jack said in his essay there. Some of this linguistic stuff is just too complicated. That's what we ran into with those th those four prototypes was Liz and I eventually looked at it and said, yes, they were saying and, but therefore more by the end of the thing, but that's because we were giving it to them more or whatever. There wasn't anything you point to, but qualitatively, we definitely, and especially over time, as we digested this more and more and had discussions about what was going on, we put the pieces together. And what we've come to realize now is that the youngsters there, those undergraduates, 
they don't have a context. They have not done a bunch of problems. And as a result, they were just spinning in error on and but therefore week after week. And this came up in subsequent groups, um, namely, well, one of them um, with groups at, at um, UC Davis graduate students, we did three story circles with them, at the Bodega Marine Lab. And I went and interviewed them on camera and did a video. And most of them got a ton out of it. But as I showed up there that day, they warned me, one of the six people we're going to have you interview didn't get much out of this thing. She was very frustrated by it, but she's only in her second year of graduate school. The others were in their fifth and sixth year. The fifth and sixth year students had already done papers, proposals, all these sorts of things. They'd failed at some things. They had a context. That they had problems they were working on in their mind. And when they heard the end, but therefore they could apply it. And the woman who's a second year student, as we began the discussion, eventually she warned me. She said, you know, I got to be honest with you. I don't even know how to write a paper yet or how to, I've never given a presentation. You know, I've done, done this stuff. And that's the problem is that this is our warning to everybody is yes, the ABT seems cool, but be careful about using it with people who don't have enough experience yet to know what you apply it to. And the, the kind of the last little button to add on to that is Liz, um, you want to come back? Let's go ahead and jump a little bit in our lineup here of what we we're going to do. But Liz, tell us about what took place at um, University of Northern Colorado, where a professor there with the best of intentions came and took part in their demo days with National Park Service and then said, let's run story circles in the first semester with our new graduate students because they've already got this orientation course scheduled and we can drop it right in there, 10 one hour sessions. Um, so we did that. And Liz, what happened? First, Liz, oh. please introduce yourself. That's my job. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, oh. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> Liz is one of our um, I know, but we but might we might have new true. people joining us today, Randy, and they Thank need you. to hear about Liz. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if only all the podcast listeners could see Randy's face. <laughs> <laughs> this is typical. I asked Jen to do something, and then when she tries to do it, I say, "What are you doing? Why are you doing?" <laughs> ask me to do it. Uh, so yes, please take it away, Liz. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I work in marine conservation here in Hawaii, and I've been part of Randy's team now for like seven years. So. I go back a ways and helping with with story circles, not the not the pilot, but um, later on. So what happened here was like Randy was saying, we had this awesome opportunity to embed story circles like a 10 week program into a semester. This was back in 2017, it was fall semester. We thought this was a great pilot because here you have this captive audience of students. And the course was foundations of biological research. So it was first year graduate students. So in addition to embedding the story circles one hour, they had two hours per week. They were also learning stuff like the scientific process and how to develop a research question and hypotheses and you know, reviewing papers and developing proposals. So all that super basic stuff. Um, so we got to it. Jade and I launched the story circles with the groups uh, in the beginning and they hadn't done a demo day. So that was one, one issue up front. Uh, we sort of just gave them an overview of how it works with some backstory and some materials to review beforehand. Um, so we did the, the orientation and then we just let them go. We stayed in touch with them. Um, about week five, we checked in and sat in on the sessions and we started to notice, it became clear that similar to what Jade was saying with the undergraduates, they weren't getting it, they were frustrated. And it, yeah, we, we, we realized that we need to bring Randy in. He came in for week six. And I feel like Randy, you could share how that went. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, <laughs> first off, good. We, know, we owe both um, a debt of gratitude and a semi apology to those guinea pigs, basically those poor 12 students who were thrown into this thing where we didn't know what we were doing. we with the best of intentions, we thought, wow, what a great thing to teach them. Well, we put them together in week six for this group discussion. There were six people in each of the two circles. So we had them in a conference room and I was on the speakerphone and it was basically a grievance session. And they began kind of venting their frustration. And Liz just forwarded me an email yesterday that was from back then. And in there was you know verbatim, some of the things that were said. Um, what were some of the things that were in there, Liz? Oh man, um, I the the big one was uh, there was a group talking, and one student kind of slipped and said the reason we feel it's a waste is, yeah. and then went on. 
and later we had, you know, just to give credit to some of, and we think it's the older, more experienced students. Someone kind of came in and was trying to quell some of that and was like, I think he's trying to tell us not to be such scientists, but a lot <laughs> of it was just frustration. You know, they weren't, yeah, they, yeah. they were supposed to learn proposals and, and other things. And they, they felt like that's what they should be doing. Well, that actually th there's, there's the, there's the problem. And in fact, the other line that was blurted out was uh, one woman said, we don't even know how to write a proposal yet. Why yeah. do we keep getting week after week, these three words and, but therefore we got them in the first week. What are you doing to us here? And they were right, you know, we were wrong. We were still figuring this out, how to teach this. That's why we're doing this session right now and starting with these caveats, which is make sure you've got the right people that you're doing this with. Because number one, you know, you can end up with a debacle like that. And number two, those people could end up three or four years later working for the National Park Service and being told, now you're gonna do the ABT framework and what's gonna happen? They're gonna, oh God, that was a nightmare. That was the worst thing ever. They forced to do that. So, you know, that, and the reason that we're confident enough to talk about this very openly is because we have literally hundreds of people now that have said the ABT framework has been transformative to what they do. As I said, I just finished this group with three major young historians, incredible three young assistant professors who are superstars in the world of history, all three of whom are using it on a daily basis for books that they're writing and essays and yada, yada, yada. So they were telling it all back to me. And I was listening, like, wow, it's really working there. By the way, Liz, side note, word that cropped up over and over again from them. You would have loved it. I wish you'd been there. Pedagogy. Oh, <laughs> oh, your favorite. Yeah. Liz um, has a whole list of words that I hate to hear about, but um, anyhow, that's the bottom line. And yeah, one more. Another oh. factor that we had recognized, I think is really critical is when we sat in, there was there, the students are new and they're young and you know, most of them were straight out of undergrad. There were a few later on students, but they weren't yet comfortable with giving each other feedback on their writing and they didn't want to be like quote negative. So they didn't understand the difference yet between like critique and criticism and being constructive in a positive way. So they were all like, great job and moving on. And yes. it wasn't helpful. So I think that's another another factor. And they hadn't already had the chance to try writing and fail at it and struggle. So those are those are top level things that we, we did the deconstruction postmortem, so to speak, later that emerged as being that's, really that's a very good point. I'd forgotten about that because that also came up in the graduate student prototype circle where in like the second or third night of that story circle, we started in on the ABT build exercise and a woman read her ABT and I set to work on it and said, you know, it sounds like the part you've got and you're there for would work better in the, the end. And all of a sudden this guy interrupted me, kind of like trying to be her hero coming to her defense, I think. And he said, you know, it's generally a good idea when critiquing someone to begin with telling them everything that's good about what they've got there before you start with all the negative. And before I could even open my mouth, the woman turned to him and said, if I want that kind of praise, I'll call my parents. I'm here to work constructively on this ABT. So let's get back to work. And the, the strength of the ABT build is that it's this is not creative expression. You're not making commentary on people's personal skills, this is analytical, where you've got a clear analytical explanation that you're giving them how to make this stronger by doing this, that, and the other thing. And that's why we've run this, you know, for over a year and a half, all these ABT builds, and it's a really good experience. Again, by making it analytical, you're getting it out of that, that commentary on people's personal styles and things of that sort. Um, okay, so that's a bunch of that first setup. Now, next thing I wanna to do to keep us on schedule here is I wanna show the video from Keisha Barr, from our narrative blitz event that we did, because this gives us a couple terms of vocabulary to include in what we're doing here. Therefore, let's see if I can get this to work. We've got this on the desktop. I hope that I can make the technology work for us. This is it right there. And let's put it at the beginning. Randy, tell us who Keisha is first, please. Um, the opening credit is going to identify her <laughs> as a faculty member. Okay. She'll be joining us in a bit, but she's a um, young faculty member, I think in her second year as professor at Texas A&M <laughs> University working. Um, <laughs> somebody's dog's barking. Okay, and uh, Jen, let me know if you cannot hear the audio on this. I hope this will play okay. This is, you can see three minutes, 25 seconds, but it speaks for itself. Here we go. Um, there will not be audio until a moment when she starts talking here. A certain level of communication Good. skill is present from the start for everyone. And it's easy to think you can just wing it from there. 
But without a Christmas tree, you'll never get that far. Therefore, let me tell you what I mean when I say a Christmas tree. And no, I'm not talking about this type of Christmas tree. But what I do mean is using a Christmas tree as a metaphor. And this Christmas tree metaphor comes from an article in Politico that was written by Dave Gold, who was a political strategist. And he shared some of the lessons that he learned from his political mentor at MIT. And in this article, he specifically talks about the differences between issues and campaigns. Issues are to a campaign message what ornaments are to a Christmas tree. So your individual issues would be like a box of ornaments and your overall narrative structure would be your Christmas tree. And in terms of the ABT framework, we're talking about the fundamental difference between non-narrative and narrative structure. By utilizing this Christmas tree metaphor, you can focus on the singular narrative, like what Rick mentioned earlier. And if you're having trouble finding what your singular narrative is, you can use the power of the Dobjansky template, what Julie mentioned to you earlier as well. Let me show you an example of how the Christmas tree metaphor applies. Here's Randy Olson telling about an ABT from the framework course. Here's an example of what's meant by the Christmas tree. This is a modified ABT from the course before revisions. Notice it talks about problems even in the blue material. You don't want this. The problems should start in the red. The blue is just for setup. This ABT lists five problems. Positions not filled, workloads not changing, expectations of work output remaining the same, feeling of overwhelmed, morale is low. That may seem like just one big laundry list of problems, but when you start to process what's happening, you realize there is one overarching problem, which is positions not being filled. All the other problems are a consequence of that. Because there's a shortage of staff, all these other things are happening. So you could view this situation as positions not being filled is the overall Christmas tree. All the other problems, workloads, expectations, overwhelmed, morale, they're all secondary, and thus ornaments on the positions not being filled tree. That is how the Christmas tree metaphor works. So when I was learning how to communicate effectively, I was essentially given this box of ornaments. This included some tips and tricks of how to become an effective communicator. Then when I started teaching and mentoring students, I essentially gave them that same box of ornaments that I had so after I took the ABT course last fall, what I realized is that I had been taught communication in an unstructured piecemeal form, but that the ABT framework actually offers a more systematic approach. And that is what I am now using with my students. So when you're thinking about communicating some of the information or the projects that you've been working on, you might want to consider what is your overall narrative structure? And think about what exactly is your Christmas tree. Okay, great. Um, that was wonderful. Uh, thanks, Keisha. That's such a good video. And, and you'll come join us in a bit. But um, I just wanted to run that video right there so that everybody's got these two main terms, the idea of a box of ornaments and basically an unstructured approach versus the idea of a model, the Christmas tree that is a singular structure that you can hang everything on. So this is what's come out of the ABT framework course that we've been running for the past almost year and a half now. And we'll be doing rounds 15 and 16 in August. Um, and we got it booked all the way through the end of the year. Um, what came out of the course last fall was this short little book, The Narrative Gym, and it's only 75 pages long. I really think it's great because it's so concise. It, it took me it took me all these years to boil everything down to something usable like that. And at the core of the narrative gym, what, what the whole course and, and the model is built around is this three-step development model. So the way that we do this teaching is that you have everybody bring in their problem they're working on, their project, their book, whatever it is, and they come up with the first draft of their one sentence ABT of what their whole you know, project is. Then we set to work using this three-step model to try and strengthen it. This is all about strengthening the narrative. Anybody can come up with their starting point for a narrative pretty easily. And, and by the way, you should always keep this in mind with students. Don't let them say, I need a day or two to come up with the ABT. You know, be delicate with them, but say, you know what? You can actually come up with it off the top of their head. Um, for example, Jen, can you tell us the one sentence ABT of your day today? <laughs> The one sentence of my day today, uh, yesterday I had my second Pfizer vaccine 
and it's made me feel incredibly sick. But I have a busy day with the podcast and a heap of marking to do. Therefore, I'm going to power on. And that is why she is the best co-host ever. <laughs> That's unbelievable. There was zero forewarning or preparation for that. Perfectly done. That shows you, you know, don't take no for an answer from students when they say they need a day to come up with it. No, you, you can come up with a bad ABT right off the top of your head. And then that's the whole process. Come up with that first draft, then start to work on it. And what the development model guides you to is it all begins by going to the middle of the ABT, to the butt, to the, the B. That's the statement of the problem. That's the be all and end all, as I was saying at the beginning. You need to go right to the butt. And this is what we do in the course is um, tell me what the problem is in five words or less. And that forces people to weed out all the information to just get it down to the story points. You know, the problem is we're running out of money. That, we get that for a lot of programs. That's their whole ABT. You know, they've got all this stuff in a whole lengthy sentence, but really you push them what, at the core, what's your ABT about? We're run, the problem is we're running out of money. There it is. Um, it's amazing how many times you push people and they can boil it down into just three or four words. And, and when they do that, the whole group like wakes up like, yes, we get it now. So step one in the development mo model is that boil it down to what the problem is. Step two then is you go backwards to the setup, the blue material at the beginning of the ABT. You don't know how to set up a problem until you know what the problem is. That then guides you how to efficiently and effectively set it up. One of the things we learned early on is when you ask people to write first draft in ABT, they tend to throw a lot of junk into the blue material, just a whole bunch of information to kind of get going. And, and that's okay. You know, again, these are first drafts, but once you get that problem resolved, then you go backwards. Now, you know what to throw out. And, you know, I didn't need to tell you all this extraneous information. Yes, it's an interesting national park that we've got here, but that has nothing to do with the fact that we're running out of money. So it gives you a criteria. So that's step two, go backwards into the setup, the end stuff. And then in the development model, the third step is then to go to the two turns, we call them on the word, but that's where you activate the narrative process on the word. Therefore is where you deactivate it, where you give the solution and the whole problem has been solved. So that's the third step. So that was the three part model. And then just a couple of weeks ago, Matt and I were having a long talk about that and about this thing and, and addressing Liz Peterson's initial request. You know, how do we go about teaching this? And we began to realize, wait a second, there's actually a lot to be drawn from that three-step model for teaching. And I think this is the draft we've come, we've come up with now that we want to toss out here. And that's what we're going to work on for the rest of this session, which is the idea that um, the, the same three elements, I think, work as a starting point, a three-point model for how to teach the ABT, in which point one is what I said at the beginning, do not try and teach this thing unless your participants have their own problem they're working on. Don't throw it out there in a big lecture dangling in space because if people don't have something to apply it to, that's what we were telling you we ran into with all these young students was that they found it frustrating to be told about and but therefore over and over again when they didn't have an application of it. But the older students who already had things that had gone wrong found it really rewarding. And by the way, just to add to what Jade had said there in that initial account about the, the four prototypes, that group at USDA um, of research scientists, they were all pretty much in their 50s. And I couldn't even get through the first session with them without them interrupting me saying, oh my God, if we'd had this ABT thing five years ago and we did that big proposal, it, it would have been so much better. That's context. That's where they already had these problems still percolating in the back of their mind. And when they hear this narrative structure, it has immediate application and you see it and they they are the ones that get it best. So we've seen this over and over again, a clear correlation with age. No, we don't have a data set. No, we don't have a PLOS paper on it. I don't know when I'll ever find the time to do that. I don't know that I want to. This stuff is so productive right now that why would I want to eat up six months of my time trying to publish a paper on it when in fact, I'd rather spend that time running more rounds of the course and letting people get to work on doing this and working with them hands-on in, in applying it. Um, so then that's the first parallel is that first point coming off of the development model. The same thing applies for teaching. Start with the problem. Everything starts with the problem. So that's message number one we have for you. If you're looking for what's the best way to teach this, understand the importance of the problem. Number two then is what we're saying about context. Be careful about trying to teach this to young people who don't have any application to it. You, there's a risk you could confuse them more than helping them. So there's limitations how far down you can go with that. Just be aware of that. Write to us emails if you want. We would love to hear your experiences and talk. And we're going to talk about it some more in, in a minute. We're going to start going through case studies starting with Jen. And then the third element in that model. So three things, the problem, 
know they have to have a context. And then the third thing is the repetition element, which is fundamental. This That's the whole title of the book, The Narrative Gym. It's this idea of this analogy of think of the narrative part of your brain as being like a muscle that needs to be conditioned over time. You can't learn this stuff in one afternoon. And be aware of that. If you want to throw it into your class and we're going to do one hour on the ABT and then hope that everybody uses it well, that's, you know, I'd rather you do five minutes a day for 10 weeks on the ABT. Literally, that's, I've never even thought of this before, but if you had to take your choice, because that was my initial idea with the story circles training was rather than do a one day, 10 hour workshop at somebody's meeting, I would rather do 10 one hour sessions over the course of 10 weeks. And that's it. It's this repeated reintroduction iteration over and over again. So that's the third key element. And I don't think we, uh, Matt, Michael Bart didn't join us, did he? Um, uh, he did not. Okay, well, he's our expert on the Dunning-Kruger curve, but that's what that's all about. If you're not familiar with the Dunning-Kruger curve, it's the idea that people think they hear something and they think they pick it up immediately. Oh, and but therefore I've got it. And they really don't. And it kind of shows when they start trying to apply it. And then it shows when they try and teach it, especially. So know that we know from 10 years of developing this stuff, it is a long-term process. And again, um, saying that thing about just on Monday alone, having this realization that we've had after me spending 10 years developing this ABT stuff, repetition is crucial. So the problem, number one, the context, number two, and then repetition, number three. Okay, that's laying down all the basics of where we are now for how we think it ought to be taught now. Let's dive into case study number one, which is my co-host, Jen Martin. She took the ABT framework course a little over a year ago. She was in the first two rounds of the course and then got back in touch months later and said, you know, I don't know if I mentioned to you, but I've been teaching the ABT framework here and having great success and results with it. So Jen, on that note, why don't you take over and tell us, I'm going to even mute myself here. Tell us the whole story of how it's gone there for maybe the next five or so minutes, whatever you need to tell us what you've learned. Randy, muting yourself. Oof, I don't know if that's going to ever happen again. <laughs> I'm impressed. Okay, then I won't. <laughs> no. <laughs> so as Randy said, I took the course a little over a year ago and I was aware of Randy's work. I'd read his books. I had a sense that he knew a whole lot about narrative, but I hadn't really thought in any way about trying to teach any of it. I guess it just wasn't at the forefront of my mind. And then one of the benefits of COVID was that I saw Randy was uh, offering his, his teaching online for the first time. And so I absolutely jumped at the chance because I had this sense that I needed to know more about it. And uh, even though it involved getting up at 4am for all those weeks, I very quickly realised that this was going to solve a problem for me. So we keep talking about problems. The problems that I had as a scientist turned science communication educator was that I knew the research that told us very clearly that we need to uh, train scientists not to just share fact after fact after fact. I knew the research. I knew it in my bones. Intuitively, I knew that one of the things I had to teach my students was how to craft narratives so that they could engage their audiences so that their audience would understand why they were doing the research that they were doing. But I hadn't come across a way that I felt I could teach that well. So when Randy and I and, and a whole group of us were talking on Monday, I put out a line which Randy immediately jumped on and I said, because there's just so many different narrative structures out there and scientists don't know where to begin. And, and Randy quite rightly jumped on me and said, well, actually, there aren't a whole lot of narrative structures. But I guess what I was trying to suggest was that I think from a science student's point of view, it's very, very difficult just to be told you need to tell a story. And from my experience, pretty much all scientists who have experienced any form of science communication training get given that advice. And often the advice is just, that's it. They don't get given any tools. So as a scientist, you're told, yeah, you need to tell a story. And the scientist sits there thinking, well, what does that mean? Once upon a time, there was a girl called Jen who liked to study animals. I think it's very disempowering for scientists. And so what a scientist tends to do then is to go and do some research and to try and learn about storytelling. And of course, they're met with this huge literature completely outside their comfort zone, often written with its own jargon that is completely impenetrable to a scientist. And many scientists just end up saying, oh, this is all too much it's all too hard I don't really understand then what it means to tell a story so I'll probably just fall back on what I've always known what I've always done which is what we would all call the AAA 
So learning about the ABT last year solved my problem, which was that now not only because could I tell my students, I really want you to learn how to tell a story or I really want you to structure your work around a narrative, but here's a tool that will help you do it. And of course, as all of us who use the ABT know, even though I'm very late to this ABT party, it becomes immediately obvious that it allows a research student, and I'll, I'll give you more information on that in a second, but most of my teaching is with research active students. It immediately allows them to say, oh, well, yeah, when it comes to my research, we know this and we know this, but the key thing is we don't know this yet. Therefore, my research is gonna try and answer this question or solve this problem. So I think for me, it solved my problem because now I could teach a tool, but intuitively, even though I do teach at both undergrad and postgrad level, intuitively, I have never tried to teach it to undergrads, at least not yet, because I guess I realised that, uh, that, that having that problem was important. So most of the teaching that I do is at postgraduate level. The biggest subject I teach is for research active students. They're doing a two year master's uh, program with some coursework and then a whole lot of research. They have their own independent research project. And it's just been what many of them call a magic tool because suddenly they understand how to follow this advice of tell a story. So how we teach it is, is over multiple sessions. So I, I got the repetition bit. We introduce it quite early in the course. We actually show Randy's uh, video, the ABT framework video, or at least the first 12 minutes of it. Sorry, Randy, I cut you off before you go into explaining how Story Circles training works, because I want to explain then how I'm going to do it in the subject. And so it's, yeah, it's repetition, it's introduction, it's giving the students examples, asking them to write their own ABT statement about their work, sharing it, getting feedback. And I think the most useful thing that we do is in response to having to teach fully online during COVID, we obviously had to change how we teach public speaking. And one of the things that we decided to do was to use some time that we used to use in a different way for teaching public speaking to give each of our students a, a, the opportunity to work with one of us 15 minutes one-on-one -on -one to talk about their research in a couple of minutes and then spend the next 10 or 12 minutes workshopping how they present their research, how they try and capture people's attention at the start and how they've set up their narrative. And that ends up being a little one-on-one -on -one ABT build session essentially. And that is gold because the more times you say, but hang on, what's really the problem? And what do you really know already? And what are you actually trying to do? I've had dozens and dozens and dozens of students get to the end of just that 15 minutes and say, ah, oh, I get my research now. I get what I'm trying to do. I get how I'm going to tell people about it. And that's just, you know, th that's what it's all about. Suddenly having this new insight into what your own research is about. And if the ABT is the tool that allows that to happen, then I'm pretty happy that I found the ABT. Um, and that's excellent. And I've got a stack of questions, but actually the way we're going to go forward here is Keisha, are you there? Um, what we're going to do now, so that was case study number one. Now we're going to have case study number two, which is Keisha took the course last November and began teaching it at um, Texas A&M and did that video that you just watched there. So we're going to have Keisha tell her case study. Then we're going to invite Liz Peterson to come on and be the interrogator and quiz both of you. Uh, with questions for her interest, because that's the original thing she wrote to me was, you know, how do I teach this? So that was awesome, Jen. Thank you very much. Let's hand it over to Keisha. Why don't you take it same sort of length as she just did on your experience? Um, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, that's really great to hear your story, Jen, because it's a lot of similarities on my side. Uh, so I was, I'm a new assistant professor. I'm in my second year. And one of my first charges as an assistant professor was to teach a science communication class. And I was like, okay, I think I'm okay at communicating my science. I'm gonna go ahead and give all these skills that I've acquired and I've learned and give that all to these students. And it was my first class that I taught. And I was like, one, this is a lot of work coming from a heavy research background. And then two, I don't really know how to teach communications because I wasn't taught how to teach communications as a researcher. So I essentially gave them all of these box of ornaments that I had. And at the end of the course, I felt like I gave them a lot of material, but none of it really was cohesive or made any sense at all. And I don't think they really took anything away from it. So I feel like I really failed 
in terms of communicating how to communicate science to my students. And then we went into the pandemic. Um, Randy started teaching his classes online and I saw it come through Coralist because um, I'm a coral reef ecologist. And I was like, you know what? I really need to take this course. I really need to learn how to teach communication, how to communicate myself so that I can become a better communicator and help my students become better communicators as well. So I took the course. After the course, I was like, wow, I did all of that wrong. Um, I don't think any of my students learned anything from this. And I really needed to restructure everything that I did. I tore my syllabus like physically because I'm like, this is symbolic of the failure that I had. And I rebuilt it from the ground up, really following the structure of the ABT course and kind of modifying that so it was over a semester. So similar to what Jen was mentioning and starting by giving some background and some importance behind why it's important that we are effective communicators as scientists and what the importance of that is and bringing in some relevance from the students themselves. Like you've had instructors who are pretty boring and you really haven't gathered that information. You may have fell asleep during class but you're all doing really exciting work and you need to be able to communicate that to the public and to other scientists and to you know, your, your family, your friends. So let's work together to make you strong communicators. And I wanna stress that the importance of this class was solely on communicating science. So the students were there to learn and it was a required class for the graduate studies at Texas A&M and Corpus Christi. So we started the course. Everyone gave me a ABT right off the fly. And throughout the rest of the course, we worked on their ABTs at the beginning of every single class. We took the first five minutes of the class. We went through the ABT as a group, we tore it apart and we gave a lot of feedback and hopefully they were able, the, the students, the ABT that it was for the, they were able to pull that back together. Um, so we wanted to make sure the biggest thing that we had with the students or I had with the students was that they had a really hard time figuring out what their problem was because they had so many problems that they wanted to talk about. And they wanted to talk about these really large problems. Most of the time it was climate change instead of like what really was the problem that they were addressing and providing that context to their problem. And once we started picking those apart together as a group and doing that group learning, it really helped facilitate the ABT structure and building it as we went through the rest of the semester. So after we got a little bit of a handle on that. They started writing, they started taking other abstracts and rewriting them as ABTs. We moved into presentations and they were like, this is simple. I do the same thing, it's an ABT. I provide some context, I introduce the problem and then I provide the solutions. And I think from there, we, they learned that the ABT is not just for writing or talking, it's also for visualizations. It, you know, it's in everything. And I think that was really helpful for them to see how they can take this tool and apply it to everything that they do. And it, it, it was a huge success. And we're, you know, I'm gonna make some changes for next year and just keep working and trying to become better. And um, yeah, it's really, really exciting to see the students really get a handle on what their problem is, what the solutions are and providing that context to help set up their audience and how that might change based on who they're talking to. Um, and one last thing I'll, oh, I'll yeah. add Randy, yeah. um, so I have graduate students too, and now we're currently in the field and you can tell I've gotten a little bit too much sun. Um, but when I introduce them to someone they haven't met before or a colleague, they give an ABT for what their research is. So we're practicing it every single day. And we're trying to get into writing emails as ABTs as well now too, just so we have that repetition. We keep exercising the ABT, even though we're not in that course, it's so important to keep exercising and building that those building those skills. All right, I'm going to say one gigantic thing right now on that exactly, which is Mike Strauss can attest the number one question we've gotten for years of doing this training is people saying, "Okay, we see how the end, but therefore works for one paragraph, but how do we do it for a ten page essay?" And what you just described there is exactly what happens, which is those people when they do what you're talking about enough they're going to eventually start writing a 10 page essay. And then after the fact, they'll do the same thing that happens with me, which is when you're done writing it, go back and search the butts and the ands and you'll see the ratio, but to and ratio will start to change because your brain gets shifted more into this argumentation mode of how you're putting things together in the problem solution dynamic. And inevitably you end up with that structure. That is awesome what you just said. And I, I will say as a side note, 
Um, in 10 years of developing the ABT framework, this could be one of our finest hours ever right now, what we're doing, because both of you, that was so great, the two case studies you both presented. Now, Liz Peterson, if you want to join us, actually, I hadn't really planned this, but now that it's coming together, I see this is exactly the direction we want to go, which is this is either your dream come true or your worst nightmare. I'm not sure you can tell <laughs> us later. If it's your worst nightmare, you can <laughs> seek a solace with Liz Foote, who can relate the same things, which is getting things that you didn't ask for. Um, but you know, you'd innocently wrote me that email about how do I teach this? Now you get the opportunity to quiz the two of them, whatever questions you want to ask them, because I think you can ask much better questions than I can at this point in terms of what you're thinking for how you'd like to apply this. So why don't you take it over for a little while here and pose some questions to the two of them if you're up for that? Does that make sense? Yeah, I would love to. Um, Go for it. I definitely, my creative juices are, are definitely going. I have a lot of questions, so feel free to stop me um, when I've asked too many. Um, right, go most, for it, bring it on. <laughs> most of them revolve around, I guess, implementation um, and implementation in different ways. So in the research lab, in our research program where our students are engaged in professional development, and then also in a classroom setting for undergraduate students that are taking like scientific literacy classes or classes that are like I teach um, an animal behavior class where I incorporate a lot of scientific um, inquiry into that class. And I would love to add this into that class where they're doing a ton of writing and a ton of hypothesis writing and things like that. Um, and so all of my questions really when it comes down to it boil down to how do I implement this uh, logistically in all three different settings? So I guess I'll jump in first and then Keisha, I'm sure you'll have plenty to add. I guess I present it to my students in the first instance as why it's been useful for me. Uh, so I, I tell my own narrative of what I've learned over the years in trying to communicate science more effectively as a scientist, as a researcher, and shared my, you know, this can just be very brief, but but shared my own experience of the, the sudden lightness of, ah, oh, this is a tool that will work for me because I find my students, as soon as they hear that this is something that I use and I find very helpful, that immediately gets them interested. And once they're interested, it depends on the situation that I'm in and, and whether I'm running a workshop or whether I'm with a student group that I'm seeing weekly. But if there's time, I do actually just show them Randy's video because I think, I don't know if you've watched it, but there's this lovely story of Randy's own narrative around how he discovered the ABT, talking about his movie. And, you know, it's funny, it's cute. There's little stick figures banging their heads because, you know, they can't and how to make this movie work and you know it's 12 minutes which depending on the length of your class might seem like quite a long time but I just feel like Randy introduces it and in a more effective way than I would otherwise but then I kind of step back and say okay so what does that actually mean what are the tools here and how do we do it and and I just try and get the students to write their first ABT quite quickly to be honest before they really understand it um, but that's okay because then they've got something to start with to then improve and work on but to me the important thing in introducing it is just sharing my own personal experience of why I've invested time and effort and energy in learning learning about the ABT because it's been helpful for me and, and I can tell stories about you know I go on the radio every week I tell I, I do a science segment every single week and being able to get in my own head how I'm going to structure that narrative of a 10 minute segment on radio around the audience is only going to care if they can see what the problem is um, it's yeah it's just been super helpful for me and I find students really resonate with that. Have you ever had to do any activities to increase student buy-in, like activities where they come to the conclusion on their own of why it's important? Yeah, look, a few different activities that, that work and sometimes the ABT comes into it and sometimes it doesn't. And I guess, Liz, I should be really honest here compared to a lot of the people on the call today. You know, I'm a real newbie at this. So, you know, I'm really fortunate that, that Randy's invited me to sort of become part of this, this podcast, but I, I'm quite new. I've only been doing this for a year. So I, I, I'm sure I don't have the best examples of, of activities and exercises to do. 
But one of the activities we do in my class is we give the students an abstract from a, from a journal, so a scientific journal, and get them to imagine how they would tell that story for a general audience. And so they have to come up with a headline, they have to come up with the hook that they would use, you know, the opening sentence to grab the attention, and getting the students to turn the problem that that research paper is about into an ABT and helping them to see just how much uh, more accessible and palatable and understandable the science is when they nail down really clearly this is the problem here that works really well and I'll just add to that I, I do a similar thing where I find articles that are typically or an abstract that's you know and 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 then I'll rewrite that to be an and but therefore and show them the and 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 then the and but therefore, and they just see how powerful it is just to you switch that into that narrative format, that, that narrative framework. And that's the buy, that's all the buy-in you need. Or you can also give an example of telling a story and just say and and and. And that's what you know most of their lectures have been in previous. But if you start introducing that narrative structure, you can see them lean in, you can see them buy into that and you point it out. And you're like, hey, now you're perking up, you're listening, you're nodding, you're agreeing with me. And that's what they want. Like my students want their audience to engage with them. And you tell them that's how you get your audience to be engaged with you. So I don't think once you show them the difference between the and, 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 and the and, but therefore, you have that buy-in right off the bat. Mm. Yeah, agreed. And I show them, um, I show them an ABT of my career, as in why I stopped being a scientist and why I decided I wanted to teach science communication. So I tell my whole story in a three sentence ABT in terms of why am I now standing up here in front of you teaching you communication skills in the middle of your science degree. And that tends to get quite a bit of interest as well, because it's personal and they can see the value of summarizing something really quickly and clearly. That's great, and that's great to hear as well. Um, how do you, especially undergrads, present them with and train them with context? That's a really hard question. Um, I have graduate students that I've been working with. So, and that's something that I think we already, we do struggle with graduate students. The graduate students I work with are in their first year. And we start with the problem and that's where we really hone in and, and try to get to them to understand what really their problem is. They, they start so big. And also we had a similar issue and I did it during the ABT course. I put the problems in the, in the blue, in the, con, in the context. And we're just thinking that we're just getting to the point. We're not setting anything up. We're just scientists get to the point. I'm gonna tell you about my methods. I'm gonna spend all my time on my methods and my results. So um, what we try to, what I try to do to refocus the students to focus on the problem first, and then from the problem, what does your audience need to know in order to understand your problem? So like Randy's been saying, working backwards and that way is, you know, been really helpful for me, even though my students are very early on and might not have all of that experience in terms of failing to communicate effectively or really having all that background knowledge. So I think that's been pretty effective for me. Um, let, me, let me add in there. Mike Strauss, are you with us? Or are you driving your car? Are you somewhere out in the <laughs> plains? Uh, of Mike Strauss is with us uh, over the phone. Let me try to enable him, him to unmute and uh, see if he can join us. Because, okay. yeah, what, yeah, see if he can. Am I unmuted? You. You're Hello? muted, Mike. We hear you. Mike, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, how about if you take a minute or so and tell about our experience in January Mike and I did a thing with AAAS, their junior academy, a high school superstar science kids that were, I think, all seniors. And we had them come up with ABTs. And we're still at this point of gathering observations and data on how the ABT framework works. And that ended up being like a large sample size of 70 to 80 ABTs. And when you looked at these ABTs written by high school kids, a very clear pattern emerged, um, which first and foremost was what, Mike? Well, very clearly emerged was that these kids were working on research, and when you asked them to tell about research, they told you the problem yeah. that they were working on, but they didn't provide you any context for the problem. And when we, we started talking about the, the why should somebody care about this, why is this important, they, they, they couldn't figure out why that, why that was important. They thought that what was most important was 
that they were solving a problem. And uh, and they wanted to talk about the problem, but they didn't want to go any further. They didn't want to go back into context. So they didn't really have a context. The problem uh, got the, they got the problem by sort of what can I do that'll get that'll get me this science project. So they they were completely problem oriented. There wasn't any driving force behind it uh, of why they should be doing that problem, other than it would complete an assignment. And and let me add to that, you know, this is, we're learning as we go along. We had a really intense discussion on Monday, all of us getting ready for this. And I think one of the things we agreed upon is that this isn't something that's characteristic so much of high school students. It's anybody who is just coming into a field of study. So you could be in your 50s starting uh, a master's degree and deciding to do a project and probably end up with the same thing, which is that your starting point would be to put together an ABT in which you would probably begin your ABT by talking about the problem because you do not yet have enough experience, the breadth of knowledge to be able to establish the context. And conversely, something I can remember back from my science days was the number of times being at a very intense seminar where when the speaker is done, big Q&A discussion breaks out and all these great scientists are in the audience and they're all adding bits and pieces and the junior scientists are adding specific bits and pieces. And then eventually the senior statesman or stateswoman scientist speaks up from the back of the room and in two or three sentences puts the whole topic into this bigger picture. And everybody else realizes, oh my goodness, you know, I, I don't have that big and broad enough of a understanding of the field. That's what comes with experience. And so it's developing this understanding of that blue material at the start of an ABT that's the that's what we've developed more and more respect for over the past year and a half is that's your biggest challenge is managing to put that blue material together the right way because if you don't set the problem up properly then the problem is just shallow and doesn't have much meaning but it takes time and, and experience and that i think is one of the hallmarks of a better and better experienced scientist i think that that's one of the things we're learning uh mike you got anything else to add to that yeah i i just uh, a quick story uh, from two years before with the same group of kids, I sat one evening with a young girl in a, in a, in a, a study lounge with her and her professor or her teacher. And we went over and developed the ABT of her, of what her project was. And most of my discussion with her is, but why should I care about that? Why is that important? Why, what are you really, what's really important about this? And after about 45 minutes, she got to the right point, but I don't think she ever understood that, that, that why, why when she got there, I said, there, that's it. But there was a young man sitting across the table from us who didn't say a word and was listening, and he was absorbing it at a really much deeper level of understanding communication. And the way I knew it was the next day in their poster session, he came walking up to me and said, see that other girl over there? And I said, yeah, and he goes, you got to go talk to her. She doesn't know how to talk about her project. So, so he really, he really got it. So some of these kids begin to understand it, but most of them are still problem, still just working on the problem and not that never, never understand the need for the context. And I think that's just experience. I think you're right, Randy. It's just, it's having to have a need to communicate and they don't have a, a real need to communicate. They just need to put something in the right form to essentially get the grade or, or meet the, the assignment. Um, and Jen or Keisha, you want to add some more comments on that? Um, and then when you're done with those comments, um, Liz Peterson, um, keep going. That, this is great. Keep going with the questions. So I will mute. Go for it, uh, Jen. You go, Keisha. I've done lots of talking. <laughs> I, yeah, I agree with what Mike was saying that, you know, that was one of the questions that one of my students asked during the course was, how do I get the highest grade I can during this class? And it was, you know, really troubling to me to hear that, like, you know, of course, students want to get a grade, a high grade, but the goal of the class is to make sure you're effective in your communications. So that, that was a bit frustrating, but you could tell which students understood that they needed help and understanding what their problem was why the community should care about it, why the public should care about it, and really provide that context for the research that they are doing. And we are kind of in that process together of, okay, this is a problem, we don't understand this, but how does that really matter to, you know, you know, the, the regular person in the world? Why would, should they care about it? Or why should it be funded? 
And we kind of took a lot of this and wrote a grant proposal for the end court in part of the course. And that was the, the goal was to secure funding. And the importance behind that, that funding was to, um, to preserve local ecosystems that they were working in. So they really had some trouble understanding not only what their problem was, but what was at stake and why was it important to the audience that they were communicating it to. So it was a struggle for all of us, but I think at the end they really went through it and they came out the other side understanding that they had a clear problem, a clear the clear context behind that problem, the solution for the problem, but also understanding how that problem could help address a larger issue instead of just mm -hmm. another check mark of doing science for the sake of science. And I, and I think, yeah, that's super interesting, Keisha. And I think the reality is that some for some students, this will always resonate more than for others. And I think some are just ready to go that next step of thinking beyond what grades am I going to get for this subject and are thinking about their place in the world and the impact they want to have. And in my case, why they're studying science in the first place. And they're just like sponges ready to soak up anything we can give them as tools to be more effective in how they speak about science and write about science. And, and others just aren't quite there yet. But I guess where I sit as an educator is if it works for some, then let's do it. And even if it just plants a little tiny seed for the others of narrative is something I might want to learn about more one day. The problem is something I need to be clear on, explaining the context. You know, we always say to our students, what can you leave out? You know, you're, you're an expert. You know so much more than your audience needs to know about this. So you're going to have to be very, very picky in what context you share or what context you leave out because you're not going to have their attention for long enough to tell them everything you know and so I just feel like if we're planting seeds maybe some of them are just still in that situation of oh I just want to get you know I just want to do well in this subject but I think for a lot of them it's getting them somewhere along this along this continuum of ABT rather than AAA and to me that's that's a massive win. That, that is such an interesting point what can you leave out um, that makes me think of in film school and editing, that's the art of editing is, you know, you mm. shoot all these scenes and then you try and shrink it down. What can you leave out to make this as concise and still tell the same story? Um, a lot of what I've put together for this whole ABT framework and how we teach it derives from the training that I got over the last 25 years, not just in filmmaking, but also in the acting classes that I took and particularly the Meisner acting program that I took 25 years ago that was so pivotal and I talked about in my first book. And before I took that course, there was a woman who had just taken it and just finished the two-year program. It's a very super intense. It's about the most intense form of acting training. And she had given me all these warnings about going into it. And she said, you know, I just got to warn you some evenings. I mean, this thing was three evenings a week for anywhere from four to six hours. And she said, some evenings you will go home deeply depressed that you're just not getting this. And then other nights you'll have a breakthrough night. And when that happens, you will go home with the endorphins going crazy in your brain. And you see the same thing with this ABT stuff. Um, don't you, Jen? Yeah. You're not in your head. Yeah, Absolutely. you see you see the students spinning their wheels and then they get that moment of what's at stake, for example. They see where that fits in, how it fits in the model, where it goes in the blue right before the butt and that sort of stuff. Bit by bit, they hit these moments. And a lot of them, it's also connecting with things they've been learning and hearing for a few years and haven't quite made sense. And then, for example, with the course in January this year, we ran round eight and um, Marlis, who is Marlis with us, Matt? Uh, no Marlis today. She no. was uh, okay. at the business. Oh, that's right. Yeah, she sent an email. But Marlis is, you know, one of the, the great <laughs> believers in all this. And she took the course for the second time. And at the end of the first session back in January of the eighth round where she had been in the first round, she sent me an email that afternoon and said, oh my God, all these things that I heard the first time through didn't quite come together. And now today in just one session, hearing it a second time around, I get it on a bunch of these things. So there are these breakthrough moments. It goes a little bit in, in fits and starts. Um, a couple other little tidbits to throw in there. Uh, this is kind of funny. One of my good friends, um, I'm going to go ahead and name names, Colleen Cavanaugh at Harvard University. Uh, she was a graduate student with me and she is a professor there of, of uh, uh, biochemistry, I think, or, or molecular biology and deep sea ecology. And her husband is a great and established physicist at MIT. And a few years ago, and, and 
I gave a talk in Colleen's lab to all of her graduate students about the ABT and they all flipped over it. And so we all went to dinner that night and Phil joined us, but he's the physicist and he's massively analytical and in the middle of telling him all about it, he finally turned to Colleen and he said, uh, so let me just ask a question. If I put the ABT on a quiz, how many points do I give for the and? How many points for the but? <laughs> and then she just said, Phil, that's the whole problem with you. You're so analytical. So yeah, some things you can't break down and, and atomize like that. Um, another little tidbit to toss in, and this is relevant to a lot of this teaching stuff. Uh, my buddy, Mike Backus, who spoke in the Blitz, he's one of the world's top experts on medical marijuana. His book is massively popular on, on Amazon. And he told me nowadays when he gives talks in the Q&A, if he finds himself losing focus, all he has to do is say the word, but, and you'll see the whole audience sit up, you know, but what, but what, and then I'll cue him. I better think of something to follow with, but the word, but that's your problem. It's at the core of it all. Understanding and developing an appreciation for how powerful contradiction is, is at the core of all this communication stuff. And I think has not been appreciated quite enough. Um, another little tidbit, some comments that were made earlier about um, if you're going to preach about communication, you need to communicate well. This is a fundamental rule that I've run into over the years. I've had people ask me to come do an interview or something, and I realize they're going to shoot this on a crummy camera, poorly lit, and everything else like that. You cannot lecture people about the need to communicate effectively and not communicate effectively yourself. So these things do matter. Uh, that's why this Zoom stuff is important. You know, it's really bad when people have crappy backgrounds like I have. <laughs> I need to work on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. And another little tidbit. Um, Oh, by the way, Jen, mentioning the AAAS video, thank you for bringing that up. You're lighting a fire that's been brewing for a while there. We've been saying for the last couple of years, it, it is a good video, but it's outdated the last third. And so we're following the same thing. I think you're mentioning this may finally, uh, Matt, make a note to ourselves. We've got to finally work <laughs> with John Rail and we've got to revise that that last part of it because there's- yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't show anyone yeah. the last part. No, I cut right. it off at 12 minutes. Yeah, yeah, and we're not even doing Story Circles training anymore now. So it's time to yeah. revise that and use that to talk, talk about the course. Um, and let's see, last little tidbit was um, these creative applications of people doing stuff with the ABT and how they teach it. Um, it's really wonderful, inspiring hearing how people are using their own techniques and tweaking off in that direction. But that's where this video we're doing right now is really important to help continue to solidify these core principles to make sure that people are guided by these things that we figured out as they come up with their own unique ways to do it. Because we're not trying to clamp down and say, don't teach the ABT unless you do it our way. Um, we'd love the idea of people doing it their own ways, but the more they can kind of match with what we've learned in 10 years of studying this thing, the better. Uh, Liz Peterson, you want to jump in at least one more round of question for our two case studies, Jen and Keisha? Sure. Go for it. Um, I would love to hear more about how you incorporate repetition both in classes and then also in your research lab, especially how you are able to incorporate it every day with your students. Um, I can go first with that. So uh, throughout the course, at the beginning of every class, we meet twice a week. At the beginning of the class, we talk about an ABT, someone's ABT for that class and kind of pick it apart like Randy does during the course. And as a group, we go through it together. Um, I don't give feedback until other people give feedback and I kind of help guide the students with giving constructive criticisms about the ABT. So we do that every day throughout the semester and that's extremely helpful because we're learning together. But alongside that, we do have working circles that happen every week for the students as well. So we're kind of doing both of those things, just um, taking Randy's course and you know adjusting a little bit to fit our schedule. And then within um, my own research group, we do have a bi-weekly lab meetings, so every other week. And um, during those lab meetings, we do practice our ABTs. And like I mentioned earlier, anytime that someone is introduced to another person that they don't know, they give their ABT about their research. And then I think one thing that someone mentioned during the course or um, within the group was um, practicing your ABT every day by writing your emails in an ABT format. So that's something that we're getting into now. So we're just constantly exercising the, the ABT muscle, just talking in an ABT and trying to make sure that we're getting that intuition or we're practicing it because once you put it down, it's like learning another language, you can lose it. So you just need to continuously work on that. 
That's super inspiring, Keisha. And I guess this is where I just say I'm still learning and I don't know if I've got the repetition right. And I'm starting a whole new uh, course on Monday. This is an intensive subject. We do a whole semester of a subject in three weeks. So there's multiple lectures and multiple shoots a day. And my my cogs are just turning really fast as I sit here listening to Keisha thinking, right, I've still got plenty of time. It's not till Monday that we start. I can completely revamp how we do it. And yeah, I'm just trying to think where I will carve out time each day to get the students practicing their ABTs each day so if any of my co-lecturers are listening we might have a few changes afoot I think (laughs) well and let me pick up on that repetition theme because it is the essence of it all you know it's the title of the book the narrative gym and just in the last few weeks we kind of pulled together all these different resources that we're getting now and realizing that it's, there are a lot of different ways to do. And this podcast, for example, really encourage students to listen to the podcast because we promise every single episode it's built around ABT stuff. There is no chit chat. There's nothing about what grocery store I went to last week if it doesn't relate to ABT and those sorts of things, which is really crucial. Um, Here's a great little anecdote from just last week, Park Howell, who is our business guy, who's part of the course, one of the instructors is long time. And in fact, he and I right now are in the thick of revising the book for a special version for the business world, because that's what he does. He's the host of the podcast, The Business of Story. And he's using it so much now in the business world that he he came up with this idea, you know, why don't we make one that puts the word business on the cover? And we tweak the content a little bit because it relates so much to the business world, the three-part structure. But last week he called me up and he told me he just did a workshop. I'm not going to mention the corporation it was with, but it was with 25 of their top executives. And the head guy brought him in and he had everybody write their ABTs. And then he set to work for about 20 minutes on the first one or two ABTs. And he was in the middle of working with one of the guys in the ABT. And the head guy got up and said, okay, Park, you know, that's great. I think we got the three words down. Now what's next? And there you go. There's the embodiment of the whole problem. And this is what Park tells me about, you know, these business people, God, they're, I mean, they're great. They got a lot of energy, but they're so short attention span and you can't hold their interest on that. And he had to explain to the guy, there is no what's next. This is, this is what's next. We're going to work on these ABTs for the entire day and we're going to iterate it. And you're going to start to develop the intuition thing and getting that across to people it's a, it's a real challenge, but I think we've also converged on this simple little formula, which is simplicity plus repetition equals intuition, the building of it. Uh, what Park's saying to me is, you know, we need to revise that a little bit because intuition, that's a little too complicated for our, my business people. Um, <laughs> what he wants to turn it into is simplicity plus repetition equals something like mastery, you know, or success or profits, or, you know, he wants the equal to be results, not <laughs> intuition isn't quite tangible enough. But yeah, you, that's great that you brought up the repetition. Um, and we got time for, well, let's see. Matt, did you say there was a question or two coming in from YouTube? Uh, yeah, we got a uh, YouTube chat question here from Andrew. Uh, this is uh, in uh, regards to the case studies we were talking about earlier of like uh, when we were like building this up and like teaching the class. Uh, do we have uh, yet publications of these case studies? Uh, any plans for any publications of these case studies? Uh, he says he's running into questions from IRB on studying how students learn with ABT about prior research, et cetera. So he's wondering if we have anything coming down the road that might help him out. I think we better we better do it, Randy. Well, you know, somebody else is welcome to do it and we'll help you out best we can. Um, Life's too short and things are too busy for me right now as we're propagating this into the business world, into the history world, into all these other directions. And I don't have the time to sit there and put together some tedious teaching curriculum when, in fact, people are getting so much use of it in these other directions. So it's got to Mm -hmm. fall to other people. And to not let the bureaucracy and paperwork get in the way of just plain learning. And that's what's so fun about what we're doing is we've been sprinting with this thing for 10 years. Rapid, you know, one of the things in the world of, of product design, they call it, uh, what is it rapid prototyping. And that's what they do. They come up with a prototype and they quickly revise it, revise it, revise it. And that's how you make things better. And that's what we've been doing with the ABT. And to bog everything down, to write peer-reviewed papers that I send into a world of, of education and people that don't understand this and are just going to pick it apart in their own perspective and ain't going to happen with me. You know, life's too short. We've got a lot of good things we're doing with it. 
And I'm not a big fan of the education world. I'm really sorry, you know, but that's their undoing is the the slowness and the bureaucracy of it. So I encourage Randy, them. now I know why, now I know why you and I get along so well. Because every time I get told I need to write more papers, I say, but I'd just rather be out there doing the teaching and doing the communicating rather than writing the papers in journals that no one's going to read anyway. This is our key thing, Randy. This is why we get along so well. <laughs> I mean, didn't Nike just say it? Just do it. Just get out there and do it. And it's it's doing it exactly. We just had this discussion with the historians, you know, previous to you know, two hours ago and the same thing, which was I was pitching to them the idea of let's make an animated piece about the Gettysburg Address and I have a dream speech. And Patty Lemerick was saying, you know, instead of taking six months to a year to do that, why don't we just do something now? I mean, it was, it was the reverse. She was the more urgent one saying, let's not take all that time. Let's just do things in the world. Um, time is slipping by. So I think that's the answer on that. And it's a shame that the learning of high school students or something like that might be impaired by uh, the need to slow everything down and bureaucratize it. So I think that's my answer to it. No, we don't have any immediate plans. The one thing we do have is what we're doing right now is I think we're yeah, right exactly. on mark. We got seven more minutes with this episode of the podcast. I think we've gotten through with some great stuff. Um, Liz Peterson, you've done a tremendous job of coming in with the the questions and driving this. And exactly. Um, you got one more question you want to toss out to Jen and Keisha before we wrap it up here? Yeah, I would love to. Um, one thing we're struggling in my research lab is that we don't have an outer circle because we're doing everything just in our group. So do you have any suggestions for including, especially in terms of if we're going to be practicing this in a repetitive way um, to incorporate people from our outer circle or ways to train them to think like they're the outer circle? Do you, do you have a web page? Do you write about your research for a general audience? Could you be writing with an ABT structure or are you guys active on Twitter? You know, I just think there are lots of ways to connect with people outside your inner circle and to, you know, because we, we, we tend to think of the ABT always as we're talking about it, but actually it's incredibly powerful for written stuff. So I'd be thinking about, obviously with meetings, can you meet with other people whenever you can, but just if you're putting stuff out into the world on social media or websites, can you practice it there and, and try and have let, let me um Let me toss in a suggestion. This just came to mind. Matt, think about this. Um, what about the possibility of what we might call a chaperoned working circle? where Liz could take one of those students and submit that person's ABT to you. And then you put together a working circle and then that student and your, the rest of your group could all sit and watch the whole process. And then you'd get four strangers that are trained in the ABT mm -hmm. out of the Google group. And you get to see that because the concern is you want strangers, but they really need to know, you know, the tools. And if you got somebody in there who just, you know, tried to skim the book or something, and then you could have a, a mess with that. But I think that could be a really cool experience. Is what, does that make sense to you, Matt? Totally makes sense. We're turning the uh, turn the working circle into a live performance, basically for a crowd. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you're yeah. So I think what you're talking about, Randy, is absolutely awesome. I guess I was answering a slightly different question, thinking about opportunities to sure. put ABT structured work into the world and see how it lands with people. But yeah. but I think yeah, what you're suggesting, Randy, of having having working circles for students is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Just to show them the procedure, uh, Liz. Uh, does that make sense to you doing something yeah. like that? Yeah, that would be really great. Yeah, yeah, Let, let's try an initial experiment. Why don't you think about that for a week or two? Um, pick one student, see if you could line it up. And then as Matt can tell you right now, there's there's over 200 people in the Google group, which means we call it the shark tank. It, all he has to do is announce that there's a circle looking for four participants and within 10 to 15 minutes, it'll fill up. Um, and I think that'd be really fun. Then you could run it and you could have bunch of the other students sitting there in the room watching how this goes and you know if you get lucky you get one of these people from the business world from park howell's group that doesn't know the first damn thing about science and can end up being the most valuable person there because they will stop you know the process and say i'm sorry i don't understand any of this terminology but i don't need i shouldn't need to i know i want to know what's the problem you're working on in simple language and forcing you know when we've had that happen a number of times and it could be the best thing of all and that grades right into patty limerick's thing about the the official fool that person from the outside who's willing to be brave enough to ask the questions that you know all the fellow scientists don't want to look stupid they don't want to ask that question and that's what's really kind of gratifying to see that dynamic start to happen because that 
way back when I was a scientist, the number of departmental seminars I sat there where I knew nobody in the room understood the talk. And yet everybody was terrified to look stupid and ask the question that the fool should ask, which is, what are you talking about here? What's your narrative? Um, so no, that's Liz, cool. I'm, Liz, I'm also wondering, like I'm just picturing for a student, for some students that will just be the perfect solution. I also think for some students that would be a little bit intimidating. I'm wondering if we could also have a situation where we as educators set up a framework for our students to work with one another. So people who have the language, understand the ABT enough, but but are acknowledged beginners that could workshop it together. And I mean, I have, I have scientists from every discipline, you know, across biomed, engineering, every discipline. So we could find people who aren't experts in each other's fields who the magic of zoom could get together and work together what do you think liz and keisha could we try and support our students to work with one another not not instead of but as well as i'm just thinking some students might find it quite intimidating to be put in a circle with with a whole lot of experts if they're um but but wait a second jen let me let me ask you but you are talking about the four participants all being graduates of the course right no, I'm, well, graduates of our courses, yes, not your Okay, course. I, I just would like to make sure that those people really do know the process well, um, that they totally. haven't skimmed a book or something like that, because that's where it could go haywire is if they're not quite clear on how the, the bill, I mean. No, 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 they'd, they'd, have to, they'd have to know well how it works and have yeah. worked with us Basic on their tools. ABTs for sure. Yeah, okay, well, let's, that's a concept. Let's incubate that. Um, for now, let's give it the working title of chaperoned uh, ABT or working circle where the, the yeah, participant, yeah, the, the host doesn't really know the tool so well, but they've got somebody with them. And I think that takes care of your work. You're concerned about them being intimidated. You'd have Liz there uh, as the chaperone to tell the participants to shut up if they say anything wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. Perfect. That, 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 that's, yeah. that solves my concern. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, that that's awesome. So Looks like we did come up with something original in this hour and a half, as we said early on, you know, we're still <laughs> making this stuff up as we go along and we're at the hour and a half mark. That's as much as we can do, but that was exactly what I'd hoped for. And I think this is a good starting point as a tool for people that really want to know how to teach this stuff. They'll be able to listen to this one episode and then send us emails. And, you know, I wouldn't be at all surprised if very soon we do a sequel to this because we clearly we're just getting started on a lot of stuff and everybody's learning as we go along. So, okay. Thank all of you. Thanks to all of you for such a great session and particularly uh, Keisha and Jen for sharing the case studies and to Liz, I think that's our wrap up. You know, we did come full circle by giving you the chance to do the, the quizzing here at the end. Um, and on that note, let's see, what are we doing next week? Uh, Jen, next week, we are going to do part two of the Blitz. All the other- Can't wait. Are, yes, all of our opinions. We're going to invite everybody else to come join us. Hopefully, we'll get a bunch of the speakers for that. Uh, I'm really enjoying these group discussions that we're doing. You know, As fascinating as you and I might be, it is just <laughs> that much more enriching to have other voices with us. So this was a great one. Everybody have a good rest of the week. And see you next week at the next episode of ABT Time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.